It is Monday, July 19th, 2021. The Board of Commissioners of the Hardwick Electric Department is meeting in the Memorial Building in Hardwick. Commissioners Ambrosino, Prevo, and Gedankin are present, as is General Manager Sullivan and Jim Kelty. Uh, since three commissioners are present, we have a quorum. Are there any changes to the agenda? I know that, Mike, that you had said that Ken Nolan isn't coming, so that's off the agenda. But I do have his response, and so I'll take the same spot with it. Okay. I would like to have a, a one item of discussion of uh, new business, um, and I think it makes sense doing it before the executive sessions. Um, and, and that's what our policy is going to be in the office now that it's open in terms of COVID stuff. If that's okay with everyone. Yep. I know we had some discussion last time, but I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. So we can do that after the VEPSA retreat. Okay, so the next item is the, uh, does anyone else have any changes to the agenda? No. Okay. Nope. The next item is the minutes from the prior meeting. Um, I have some corrections for the minutes. Um, there are two ways that we can do it. I, I can either say what they are and we can approve them with the corrections and then I can give those to Mike. Or, okay, are you okay with that? Yep. Okay. So, Mike. So, uh, I'm going to write them right on this. Or I can, I can give this to you. Okay. I can, I can, I can give this to you. Um, and then I can explain what all my scribbling is <laughs> afterwards. Uh, but, but just for the record, um, uh, Vince, uh, Commissioner O'Connell, was here at the last meeting. And um, he's not listed as being in attendance. Mm -hmm. um, Good point. And then if we go to the second page, uh, the fourth to last bullet, uh, it says Chair Gedanken moved to take the meeting into executive session. That sh uh, motions should be verbatim, and, and so that would be Chair Gedanken moved to go into executive session to discuss a confidential employee matter. And then I think in the second to last bullet, uh, there was no motion, so there wasn't really a vote. I, I went back and, and watched the, the video to make sure it was, <laughs> my recollection was correct. Uh, so I would take out the second sentence. Where are you? In the second to last bullet under new business. Yeah. So the much discussion set sentence should come out, and I think it should just be replaced with a sentence that says the consensus of the board was to meet in person. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't a lot of discussion about going to the back. To well, there there was, but we don't usually we usually don't say there was a lot of discussion about this and a lot of discussion about that because it's not really reporting an action. But if 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 you're more comfortable, we can say after much discussion, the no, consensus of the board was to meet in person. I think we're. I think it's. Uh, my, my main, no, my main con concern was that there wasn't a motion, so people weren't voting. Um, and I, I think there's a typo in the second bullet, or I could be wrong. This is SIS process. That's supposed to be CIS process? No, system impact study. That's, okay, and we also have a CIS in the back that's different? That's customer information. <laughs> okay, that's what I thought that was. There you go. It's so perfect. For <laughs> we, need, we need an acronym list. Yeah. So I'll give you I'll give you this um, okay. Mike. Oh, in fact, here I can give it to you now. Thank you. Can you sign it? No, you'll, it'll be printed, and then I'll sign it after it's printed up. It needs to be redone. But is there a motion to approve the minutes as amended? I make a motion to approve the minutes as amended. Second. Uh, well, that covers all three of us. <laughs> is there, uh, uh, any objection? If none, the minutes are approved. Which takes us to public comment. Jim, do you have any comments? Okay. Um, Sean's not here yet, so I would say, Mike, we probably. 
I'm home. Oh, he's, he's, he's not coming. Correct. Got it. Sorry. Okay. Can I clarify that I'm filming for HCT? Sure. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Is this something that we need to discuss today? Uh, no, it's your, you wanted a, you were talking about oil pricing, how that may or may not affect. Yeah, no, I, I think maybe we take this home with us, we can look at it and, and then have, have Sean come in person next month if, if we, you know, if we need. It said you'd be ready to go. I, do, I just think it's awkward to have a discussion of, graphs when the person who's produced the graph isn't here and but we can do that. I mean if we can reach him or we can try him again later. And I told him five fifteen, so we're actually a little early. We're a little early. So why don't we why don't we go to the general manager's report then and we will come Actually why don't I do the ITP thing when, uh, from Ken. Okay. So this was the um, I cracked the egg on this 2.2 megawatt provider block project, and I didn't have really good details in the, in the weeds, and uh, you guys wanted more information. Uh, I did circle back when also with Eli, and he said, yeah, this has been an issue before. Um, Vermont Electric Co-op actually created a transmission wheeling tariff for such projects. And that's how they end up getting a couple extra dollars out of, the, out of these projects. And he said, you know, one might not, uh, why not constitute you going through the work and rigmarole of getting a tariff, but if you have two or three of them, which we do, we actually have more than two or three, uh, so it's probably time for us to start looking at that. So here's what Ken had to say about the project. Uh, Norwich Solar approached VEPSA in early May about the possibility of constructing a 2.2 megawatt solar array in North Bullpit and partnering with VEPSA to bid the project into the state standard offer program provider block. This would give Norwich access to the portion of the standard offer program reserved specifically for utilities. Uh, VEPS has done this type of structure in three previous years, and I talked about, about some of these. Lindenville, uh, Salvage Yard in Morrisville, uh, Center Road and Hardwick. Under these arrangements, the developer permits, constructs, and owns the project. VEPS then enters a purchase power agreement with the developer at a similar per kilowatt hour price to that it would enter for a direct purchase. However, VEPSA then adds a profit margin to that price and bids the project into the standard offer auction. If the bid is accepted, VEPSA enters a standard offer. You, you got to you got to slow down, Mike. I, oh, I, I, I can't. I can't. I don't know about everybody else, but I, I'm. It's quick. I'm not processing this. Do you want this? You can read my. This is the printed copy. Oh, thanks. That he emailed to us. Okay, I, I. Somehow I missed this one. Go ahead. Uh, so, go ahead, Mike. Which which um, paragraph? Let's start the second paragraph over. Yes, slow okay. down. So I, I spoke to you previously about the prior projects and the twenty five thousand dollars of revenue that we get from those projects. Remember? Mm -hmm. So these are those projects: uh, Linden East and Linden West. That was targeted uh, partially because it was a brownfield. So there was other benefits to Lindenville, the municipal of Lindenville, to do that project there because the brownfield got cleaned up as part of the project. Uh, 
Uh, Trombley Hill, Morrisville, we're in that one. Salvage Yard, Morrisville, we're also in that one. Center Road is here in Hardwick, and that's going right up the hill, just up the hill here on uh, Ken Davis's property. So, so when you said that we get 25,000 from these projects, that's that's Hardwick's share or that's VEPSA gets? No, that's the benefit to us from all those projects. Okay. And, hey, Okay. So the black one, skip down to the that's what retains the differential in pricing is revenue that offsets our member dues. Hardwick pays roughly 10% of Vepsa's dues, therefore roughly 10% of the net revenue received by Vepsa would prove our benefit. So that's the 25 grand piece I was talking about. So, so when you say that Vepsa enters into a PPA with the developer at a similar kilowatt hour, similar to what? Similar to their bid price plus a little bit. A little bit is what we get. So they have to bid this whole thing into an auction. Right. No, I understand that. They, as the developer, can't bid into this block of auction. So they say to Vepsa, we can do this for a penny. Vepsa says, okay, state, we can do this for a penny plus a little. Right. But what happens if they don't, if, if the price that Vepsa bids into the auction is too high. Then you don't get awarded the... You don't get awarded. Does VEPSA still have a contract for, for that power, or...? Uh, it's specific to the site and everything, so I would say no. So the contract, so they'd enter a con I mean, presumably you need to have a contract before you bid into the auction, because otherwise yes. you don't know that you're going to be able to deliver Yes, and herein lies part of the project, uh, part of the problem. And they were at, the developer was in a huge uh, schedule crunch and trying to rush everything because they only had until July 15th or 14th, mid month, to get their bid in. And I said, well, I can't even get a system study ready to be run by the 15th. So their window of opportunity has gone by, and this is a moot point. The, the developer block project is a moot point for this year. So, they, they missed the auction. Okay. But I still thought you'd like to know how it works. I, okay. All right. So this is not something that we're looking at doing. This is just an explanation of the process. Of what was brewing. Yes. Yes. Great. Thank so um, I'm just going to continue. It's worth reading all this. Okay. In addition, in most cases, the host utility also receives some ancillary benefits. Uh, like I said, cleaning out the troublesome brownfield to making lease payments to providing transmission revenue. In this case, since Hardwick is also hosting the Center Road project, the Norwich proposed project would result in Hardwick hosting substantial excess finger office supply. Those utilities hosting standard office supply greater than their obligations are allowed to charge the other utilities transmission for their share of the power. So we would be able to do that, charge a transmission tariff if we got QC approval to do so. So that's one of the other pieces where we could get some revenue. Where you were saying, well, why would we do it for nothing? There are other avenues yeah. to get other. Wouldn't we, wouldn't we need FERC approval for a transmission tariff? Yes, absolutely. So it's, 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 it's not the PUC that would be approving it, it's FERC. It's not just the PUC approvals, correct. FERC would have to give us the transmission, correct? Yeah, I mean, PUC doesn't have jurisdiction over transmission no. at all. But they have to approve the project before we can. Yeah. OK, so lastly, and this is, um, well, we can continue that. In the event that the project wasn't able to be part of the, of the standard offer program, that's a, a will either stop pursuing it or might work with Hardwick to craft a structure that allowed other Benson members to utilize the tier two credits from the project while bringing value to Hardwick. We've done that on our fuel switch projects and line switches we've done the last few years. We got a hundred and some odd thousand dollars two years ago off it, and this year we haven't actually cashed out yet, so we'll know that for another month or two. Um, 
So anyway, whether that value would occur through transmission payments or some other uh, types of mechanisms would still need to be determined. This is the general structure of what they are trying to do. Okay. Well, that's, that's, that's helpful. Is I, I, I just barely sent this out yeah. 20 yeah. minutes ago. Yeah. Then, so. yeah. Oh, thanks. Please hold while I try to connect you. For the record, Commissioner Smith has joined us. For the record, what? You're here. You're here. For the record, I'm here. <laughs> Earlier than I had anticipated. Okay. You're in demand. I could have rescheduled this, but my other meeting was done in January, and I forgot about this. Okay. Well, I would I would say then that oh, he's going to try getting Sean again. Trying to get Sean on the phone here. Now, what do you think? Is that 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 is an impressive part? Yeah, that is a couple of times. Jeez, <laughs> it's big, huh? I forgot. Not how many panels? One, two, two, one point six. <laughs> I keep meaning to go down there, to see it in person. Yeah. But I've got cameras down there at night. It's good. Let's move on. I'll try okay. It again after the next. Yeah. Session. All right. So the next item on the agenda is uh, the general manager's report. Um, why don't we do questions uh, before Mike updates us on the VETSA retreat? Does anybody have any questions or comments on the report? Is that vision metering? That's the, the poll that's up on uh, Bridgman Hill? Correct. And it's just not high enough to work. Uh, they said we needed to go up, so they asked me to extend it 20 feet. and. I told them 20 feet wasn't going to do anything, so I got a crane up there and it went up 85 feet. Uh, and it still wasn't performing uh, as they expected. So uh, they are now running a propagation study for us to tell us why it wasn't working and what we would need to do to get it to work. So we'll know more here in the next couple of minutes. They're not looking too good. Right. Okay. Yeah, I was very disappointed, especially, you know, going up that high. Right. The, there wasn't a significant improvement. I think we got another, there's 20 meters out there. We were reading five to begin with, and we got another five. So it was only getting half at 138 feet. Not close. No. So we'll see. More to come on that. Okay. When is the shutdown for Wolcott? Uh, it's all... We try to do it the first two weeks of August every year. Okay. This year we're actually going a little early uh, because Rod Foster, the turbine expert from Ontario, is scheduled late in any year, actually the week of the 22nd. So we're going to start the week of the 22nd. Is that when they're going to do the physical work also, same time? Or is this a separate shutdown? No, nope, we're going to do the shutdown, the annual maintenance on the turbine every year that we do. Uh, is the one that's going to begin the 22nd, but we're also doing that cleaning uh, of the turbine from the from the oil that went into it. Mm -hmm. So they actually do a citrus wash uh, on all the insulation, and we're also doing some repair on the collector rings on the shaft for the exciter for the DC energy that makes the magnetic fields in the generator. And that concrete work? Concrete work starts. Uh, the week of the 29th. So, and they're going to go longer. They're going to be like five to six weeks. So we're going to be shut down for a while. Yeah. Usually it's a two week shutdown. We'll get everything done back online in two weeks. But with the concrete work, you know, their demolition, <coughs> the surge tower has half a, half a million pounds of water in it if it's in service. So that has to be empty while they're pounding on the foundation to get down to the hard stuff to fix it. Plus the drawings. <laughs> so it'll be September then when it's yeah. when it's back in service. Yeah, September before we get back, in. which is actually that we won't have water till then anyway. So we'll and you said water today. And, and and the company that's doing this is based, you said, in Ontario. No, our turbine expert is in Ontario. 
months. He's coming to do the turbine, the generator, the etc. Right. That stuff. The concrete work is. Uh, that's what I was talking back. about. That's what I was talking yeah. about. Yeah. Blow and Cody, right? Out and and he's going to be able to come. Oh yeah. Okay. And you mentioned that it was built in 1937. Is it a suggestion that it hasn't been worked on, or this hasn't been done? The concrete yeah. has never been touched since 1937. It needs attention badly. I mean, you saw the pictures. Of this. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Good. This is the one I was telling you that we lost a surge tower at the Citizens, and it fell over right into the powerhouse, and we lost the whole powerhouse. Surf City, Florida. Yeah. Jeez. By the time we get the head gates closed, it's too late. Okay. Good. Any so, yeah, this will be a good project. Any other uh, questions? Just Jasper Hills and Hills Farms that are clients now, right? This is yes. going in. Are they receptive to people going in and talking to them? Yes. Yeah. The, the initial contacts have been made. We actually whittled it down to them from a list of uh, eight, I think, that we originally targeted. So we'll work with them this year, probably part of next year, and then grab two more and continue the program. And this is just to help them be more efficient? Uh, no, this is to uh, promote public power and help our customers uh, with anything that we can help them with that we have it in the past. It's an initiative. It's one of the uh, it was one of the 2020 initiatives of that sort of strategic plan to start this program. Um, a little behind schedule, but it is it has been rolled out with some of the other steps and members, and it's going well. So. And it's free to them. Yep, free. Look, looking at at this at some of the information that was provided. Um, Slides are numbered. The one that says, need number one, bring the utility to the table. Um, I, I think the, the last bullet there, um, that, that Efficiency Vermont is providing all the other programs except for reliable yeah, power, and, and I would hope that we would be doing more of some of the other things. Yeah, part of the, part of the origin of this entire initiative was that we were finding out third hand that Efficiency Vermont was with customer X working on a project that we could have helped with and we missed the boat mm -hmm. because they didn't include us. And there was quite a gap between uh, the team at Efficiency Vermont and the local utilities and VEPSA. So we've uh, bridged that gap to VEPSA. Julia and Melissa are kind of the team to go to. Um, and when we started this initiative at Hardwick, there was actually a project going on uh, at Bell Farmstead that I was unaware of. So Julia laid the groundwork to get us included in those discussions and the ongoing work. And the gap is still in place. It took like four efforts on her part to get everybody together because the EU wants to be the one to wave their flag at the end and say, look at this great stuff we did. They don't want they didn't want to share it. And we want to be part of it because we want to help our customers. We can offer things they can't, you know, and we can assist on things they're doing as well. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really about the customer and it took some convincing to get them to accept that that's really what, what we wanted to do to help customers. So a while back we talked about going to the big ten biggest Customers, mm -hmm. like this is kind of play with that. But have we actually made contact with ten customers and said we're here to help, or we're kind of doing it through this now? That's the initiative that's going on right now. And do we wait for them to go to the customer first, or do we make some? No, you know, we. I I decide. I mean, I picked these two. After, like I said, we started with eight, and uh, we whittled it down to these two to target for this year. Um, if we want to target 10 next year, yeah. we can. I mean, the, the reality is I don't want to overcommit and under right. But you said efficiency for months sometimes going directly right. where you don't know about it. Right. So, yeah, anything <coughs> they're doing, at least we're aware of it now. And we can certainly jump okay. on that. If they're at, you know, Mike Ambrosino's house doing a project, Mike Ambrosino Construction, we're going to be in the office <coughs> to know that that's going on. In, where we didn't before. Yeah. Yep. 
In, in looking at this, one of the things that struck me is it is going to provide assistance to customers, but there's also a, an, an economic development aspect to it, which helps then all of our customers. Um, but that's not something that either we or VEPSA are particularly well equipped right. to handle. And I just wondered how are the, the town managers in, in the various towns or, or whoever functions in that role? I mean, I don't know if Green, does Greensburg Borough have a town manager? Greensboro? Yeah. Well, no. As a select board. Yeah. But, or, or, or how, in that case, you know, the select board is getting involved in, in this. Whoever, whoever, it seems to me there's an opportunity to be working with, whether it's the select boards or the town managers in the towns that, that these customers are in, um, because they may have insights sure. that, that we don't have. Um, and it's just, it's just a good way to be uh, cooperating. And, right, and that's, I mean, I, the last thing we want to do is miss an opportunity with somebody like they were missing with us. So, I mean, yeah. That point. Um, the other question that I had was, was just on this slide that says revenue protection and load growth. What does 1% load growth look like for each utility? And I was trying to, under, the underlying, I didn't see any underlying assumptions in this, so I didn't understand why 1%, uh, I'm really not sure how to read the whole chart, to be honest, whether it, it takes, for example, 58 residential, for hardwood, 58 residential customers to generate 1% load growth, but two industrials, but why does it take if that's if I'm reading that correctly, why for Barton does it only take three tenths of an industrial customer for one percent load growth? If you were industrial in the first place, is what I assume. But. Yeah, but that that means it would take more. Yeah, um, I'm not positive, Lynn, but the the initiative or the strategic goal of this, one of the strategic goals of VEPSA was to increase everybody's revenue by one percent without. Uh, causing this harm. Yeah. And Julia is, this is Julia's baby, uh, and she would be very happy to present on it if you guys want to get down in the weeds. Yeah. Um, I just, as it, just, you know me in numbers. Yeah, just yeah, yeah. out of me. <laughs> Good question, man. Um, and so, and so on the teams, you're working with the teams, it, because it, it, again, on the, in the, Slides it said you know includes three to five vep st staffers and potentially member utility staffers. I'm on it. Okay, that's. I think that was. A lot of paper there. I thought. <laughs> what? But I thought there was an awful lot of paper there. Yeah, it, 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 it hurts some trees. Oh, you want your electronic now? No. Uh, those were my only questions. Did anybody else have any questions? Yeah. I'll go back and just make a comment on the uh, pictures that you provide on the Walter Dam. They're really good pictures, man. Mm -hmm. This all the time provides the pictures. It helps a lot. The yeah. quality of that picture. It's quite extraordinary, I think. Got yeah. the detail on that. So Almost like being there. Oh, they're good. Yeah. It was done on an Apple phone. <laughs> Most likely. Okay, Mike, do you want to give us a report? Or are you trying, you're trying Sean again? I'm trying one more time. Okay. Sean? Yeah. But he's supposed to be with us at 5.15, but he's not. My suggestion was that we, we can do it in the future. 
And yeah. yeah. Why don't why don't why don't we just do that? These are the slides that he was going to speak to. So the retreat today. Uh, that today is part owner of an entity called Hometown Connections. And they were part of the American Public Power Association and broke off uh, as a separate entity that a bunch of joint action agencies purchased in Bexley with um, Their mission is to provide innovative and cost-effective solutions to meet the unique needs of public power utilities. And their vision is to be the strategic partner and trusted resource for public power nationally. So the CEO uh, for Hometown was there today. He facilitated the meeting. Um, and I'll, I'll share these with you when I get back to my office. <laughs> the fans can make me pay. So we talked about all kinds of stuff nationally, things that are uh, driving changes, the shifting regulatory environment, uh, aging infrastructure, new technologies, customer preferences was a big topic from baby boomers to Gen X, Y, what people want, what they don't want, uh, and increasing financial pressures. Nationally, there's a lot of uh, environmental regulations in flux. One of the big, big things that's of concern is there's a new uh, FERC rule 222. Actually, I think it's 14. It's 2222, where uh, FERC is looking at forcing the ISOs to allow behind the meter generation, such as all our net metering projects, to get into the ISO market, which would be an absolute nightmare for us. Um, all the utilities are in agreement, it would be an absolute nightmare. Uh, the Department of Public Service agrees with us that it would be an absolute nightmare, but apparently the chairman of the PUC and one of the other three board members think it's a great idea. I think Sean just called me. I'm going to check. Good grief, my oh, man. Hang on. You there? I, I, I don't think people, unless this gets much louder, people are not going to be able to hear this. Yeah, pretty much. Can you speak clearly and loudly, Sean? I'm holding the phone right up to my, my uh, okay. mouth. Is this okay? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. good. So yeah. you're here to, I've given the board your two slides, and we want a market update and what you are seeing we're expecting based on the rising costs of oil. Thank you. Sure. So, no apologies, everybody. Good to see you this summer, or hear you rather. Um, market update. There's a bunch of squiggly lines on a pricing chart for New England electricity there. And the headlines you're seeing are not wrong, of course. Uh, since January, uh, Commodities in general, but oil and gas in particular, have gone up. That's just moving in lockstep with this very fast moment of economic activity we're in. Um, specific to New England, though, it's a very, very seasonal movement, meaning the summer months are largely unchanged. It, there's not a lot of price changes from April to October. It's primarily been the winter months that have jumped up and as you might recall, we had a very cold February this past uh, winter. So that in particular, at least in my opinion, uh, drove up prices for winter power. Uh, how much? You know, winter power back in January was about $60 a megawatt hour. We're seeing pricing now that's 80 to $90 a megawatt hour for those peak winter months, January and February. Um, that is 
is all about natural gas supply and more specifically all about pipeline availability. Um, so those prices, I can't predict how sticky they'll be. Um, we may not have to pay them depending on when we go to market. I also want to tell you a little bit about the story that's coming up in the next three years. Many of you are probably aware that several thousand megawatts of offshore wind have finally been permitted by the federal government to be built offshore of Connecticut, Massachusetts. Those are predicted to come online two and a half years from now. If they come on as scheduled, there's predicted to be a significant drop, specifically in wintertime New England prices. That's relevant to us because we're looking to buy uh, 2023 to 2027 power. That's our five-year window. So I can't predict whether the market will um, reflect that uh, when we finally go out to market, but it's built into the expectations that are in this chart that I'm seeing and several other market sources. So it's a really mixed story. In the short term, 2022 prices are definitely up. Whether that will persist for the winter of 2023 when we first start purchasing here in the next month or two, I don't know. But certainly partway through the five-year period, price levels are expected to be you know, pretty settled down and lower than they are today. So I'll pause. You probably have more specific questions, but that's uh, – synopsis as I see it. Good. So, so, the, so the effect is going to depend on really what happens with, with our coverage and when we have to go to market. All right. So I can speak specifically to that. Um, I have a meeting with Ken, I think it's on the 28th here, not quite two weeks away, to show him the volumes for each member. These are megawatts and megawatt hours per month that I think we should be purchasing during this time period. So um, he'll want to look that over. He almost always pulls in his buddy James Gibbons and give those volumes a hard look. The reason I bring that up is two parts, Lynn. First, it's on the near-term agenda to decide how much we need. Second, it's to emphasize that this is not a flat, what do I mean by flat? I'm not planning to buy around the clock power for everybody. We already did that last December with the Brookfield power. Um, what we're likely to need is very seasonal power. In your case with bulk at hydro, you know, you're gonna need power July through October probably to take care of the dry months. And depending on the system, you may need some January, February power. So it's going to be a mix. And so this is a very averaged out 7 by 24 picture you're seeing. And when I come back to you, if you meet in a month, I mean, that's the earliest it'll be. I'll have very specific volumes, and we can talk very specifically about what the prices are for the volumes I want for you a month from now. That would be good if you could come and, and, and join us next month. Yeah, um, no problem. I think, I think that makes that makes sense. Hey, Sean, this is kind of a bizarre question, but is, do you know if Global Foundries is actually going to get off green power systems? Is that going to happen? I don't have an update on that that's current. Um, last I heard, and this has been over a month now, they were well down the path with Montpelier. And I say that generally because I there's multiple regulators at play here. It's probably just not just the PUC. But yeah, it's my understanding that they're moving down that path. They certainly had Green Mountain Power support at the highest level. So um, I believe they're planning to leave the system and so that, pursue, procure no power. And, and, and they're a big user of power for the state. Would that power then become available to other utilities less expensively because they're available? How would it impact our cost? Probably not at all. They're certainly large in the scheme of Vermont energy supply, but they're not very large at all in the scheme of New England. Um, and I, I used to work at Greenmount Power, and we, we very deliberately kept ourselves short on electricity supply in the event of a change like this. So I'd be surprised. Well, first of all, Greenmount Power is going to defend its existing customers. They're not just going to let global foundries leave and leave their supply behind. Uh, so 
there'll be some financial arrangement to make Greenmont Power's customers whole, and that supply will be part of it. So um, it should be neutral to Greenmont Power's customers in the end, and it's just not a large enough volume to really move New England prices, in my opinion. So does everybody know what that's all about? Basically, global founders. So IBM and Essex Junction used to be very focused on uh, stability and reliability. They needed perfect power all the time, 24-7. And they, Green Mountain Power, we don't care what you do as long as you're reliable. And now Global Foundries has come in and they have businesses all over the world where they are their own power broker. And they don't like the way GMP does the purchasing the power and selling. So they want to do it themselves. And they actually uh, petitioned the commission to allow them to become their own utility. And that's what this is all about. So it's it's not being done as customer choice. It's being done as, as, as Global Foundries becoming a utility yeah. with a single customer. You got it, yes. I think they might generate a lot as opposed to buying a lot. What's that? I think they want to generate more than they want to purchase. Uh, they don't have any generation. Not yet. But yeah, right. right I think right. they want that to. could very well be. Right now they're about a 350 megawatt customer on the GMP system, which actually they're not on the GMP system. They have a direct tie to Velco, but Velco can't serve retail loads, so all through paper it actually goes through GMP. But that's that's what they're looking to change. That's what it's all about. Yeah. So Sean, does the uh, 100, I think it was 112 percent coverage in the last month or so, does that influence any of your thinking on this? No, month to month coverage is, is bouncy, for lack of a better term. It, it moves around, so no. And in fact, we've got Walkit that's going to be on maintenance and it's already a dry spell. It almost doesn't matter. So. You know, we may actually be a little short on coverage in the next month or two, but um, prices are pretty relaxed, pretty tame in the summer. I'm not too worried about it. And we have H11. I'm sorry, can you say that again so I can hear? He said we have H11, the solar project. Coming on. Uh, yes, that's coming online. Gosh, I haven't looked at the latest, but it should be coming online here within a month to six weeks. Yeah, they, act, they actually sent an update today, Sean. Uh, they're going to be fully commissioned and complete 8 18 21. Great. One month exactly, yeah. So, you know, we're on the downside of the seasonal solar availability, but that'll that'll bring things up. I'm trying to remember where your budget was. I think that'll line up pretty well with your revised budget. Yep. So, um, shouldn't be a lot of deltas there. And the deltas will be in our favor, I think, because I think it's a little earlier than what we expected. Okay. Anyone? Yeah, I don't have... oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, it's just my thinking went to renewable energy credits as well. It'll help on that side of things as we roll forward. Anyone have any other questions for Sean? Did you speak to this IRP page? Certainly, yeah. So I, I gave you one page out of a long document, and it's the conclusion page. Um, the direction I got from Mike was to keep it simple. So the first two decisions are just saying, hey, we need to buy power for this five-year period. We've been discussing that already. Um, I hope this isn't new to you, but if it is, let's discuss it. You know, purchasing energy doesn't always save you money, doesn't always cost you money versus the status quo, but it definitely reduces your risk. That's the purpose, and that's what the analysis found. The same thing is true of renewable energy credits, um, but I do want to pause on renewable energy credits. We're seeing a shift in that market just this past month or two. Um, how to couch this for you? Corporate buyers. And Amazon is the top of the list. Mike, you might remember the graphic from today at yeah. the retreat. Yeah. There are companies like Amazon, but Amazon's at the top of the list, that's buying a lot of renewable power on the voluntary market, meaning there's no regulator or no state legislature that's saying go buy renewable power, Amazon. They're doing it unilaterally on their own. And their actions with the actions of other companies in the S&P 500 
have really raised the price of renewable energy credits by a factor of two, I would say. So you might recall the Brookfield contract. Back in December, we bought renewable energy credits for something like $2, $2.50 of renewable energy credit. We're seeing prices about double that right now for the very same product for the very same periods of time. Um, to put that in context, Vermont's statute puts a cap of $10 on these kinds of wrecks. So we're kind of right in the middle of the range for the very first time. And that is likely to persist, number one, which means I'm going to show it to you in your updated budget projections this fall, which is, for my part, is starting in August. So I'm actively modeling the cost of higher renewable energy credits for you. And um, it doesn't change the conclusion on this handout you've got. You're still hedging price risk, but it's, it's more expensive already than it was when I modeled in your uh, long-range integrated plan. I'll pause there just to make sure that makes sense and uh, it's an important point. No questions I, on that? I, I, th I, I think the silence is it makes sense. Okay, good, good. So to me, the most interesting parts of this page are number three and number five. Uh, these are new and specific to you. No other VEPSA member has chosen to look at these questions quite this deeply before. Um, so number three, I asked myself, what if Hardwick Electric Department decided to do what Burlington Electric did years ago and just buy enough renewable energy credits to become 100% renewable effective January 1st, 2028? Then the name of the game is you got to keep buying them in proportion to your forecast load requirements. Keep yourself at 100%. So at the time, this a couple of months ago now, that looked like a very modest cost to me. $178,000 a year, 2028. Definitely caused a couple of percentage points of rate pressure in that year, but it dropped over, over time. The conclusion, based on what I just said, is different now, of course. It'd be more expensive. Um, but it's a choice and it's manageable. I think the way I've couched it here is this kind of investment would look inflationary if you chose a year to do it and you didn't have other cross pressures on you. And I'll, I want to use that as a transition to number five because we're right in the middle of the last stage of our storage RFP. And we have very, very competitive bids from some of the biggest players in the North American market, think NextEra as well as some of the smaller local players. They're all pricing very competitive for storage. And what I'm starting to see is that we can save maybe a percent or two um, in the first year of a battery contract. So I bring that up because you don't want to raise rates ever if you don't have to. But if you chose to invest in number three and get yourself renewable, you could try and get storage built at the same time to offset some of that cost. And I didn't come out and say that because I don't want Montpelier strategizing on our behalf. I want us to be making that decision. But there's an opportunity, I think, to uh, line up an investment with storage with an investment if you wanted to and be more renewable. So that's what I learned from the IRP. Sean, do the two things have to be linked or are they really independent but convenient because one's an up? and one of the others are down. They're totally independent, okay. uh, but they're, because they're subject to our timing and management, we could line them up such that the financial pressure is off, they offset each other. Right, so it's convenient, but it's not necessary to link them. Exactly, you okay. don't have to do them in tandem. You could choose storage only, yep. For, from an environmental standpoint, you, you be going all renewable to benefit the environment. If you then do battery storage, aren't you undoing what you just did to, I don't know what the extent is, but to some not insignificant extent? Are you thinking the impact of the mining, Lynn, or? I'm thinking the life cycle on, on, on batteries. Uh, it's, 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 it's the mining, it's the disposal. Yeah, it, it, I think the disposal may be even more so than the mining, but I'm I, it's I, I'm not an expert on it. I just know that there are issues. But it is I, the purpose. The intent is a direct reduction in peak usage, which is gas. 
right? It, well, it, it is, yeah, that's why you would go for the all, well, that, but again, if you're doing it the solar or solar and wind, you are reducing the, the usage of gas. You're talking about doing it at peak, but but. But that's the purpose of storage is to is to. Is to peak shave. Peak yes. shave, yeah. And peak is peak energy is not green energy usually. It's, it's gas, the worst. right? Sh uh, Sean, what is our peak energy? Mm -hmm. It's. Well, it, you guys are right on the issues as always. I. I I love your questions. I agree with the premise. Storage definitely has a strong environmental footprint. Lynn, I don't have any more expertise or awareness than I think you do on this. It's a long-lived asset whose disposal is uncertain. Um, I'm investing in it from a financial standpoint to keep your transmission costs down. Yes, it definitely shaves peak and therefore eliminates a little bit of carbon emissions, but I want to emphasize it's a little bit. It's not very much carbon because it's not it's it's so such a brief period it's it's really the transmission play yes it, and it's, it's avoiding these 80 to 90 dollar peak rates in the winter oh much more than that yeah, yeah. I mean, when things spike they go up into the hundreds pretty quickly here in new england yeah generally now we're around 80 percent renewable is that about right Right now, by statute, you're in the 50s. I think this coming year is 59% renewable. Well, how did I get that number so yeah, high? We have, uh, we're, yeah. har we're higher. Harvest you're, Electric you're, is higher. I thought we uh, Let me take a guess. I think you're really thinking not. of your carbon emissions. You have a no. pretty significant mm -hmm. supply still coming from the Seabrook nuclear plant for these next year and a half. Right. Um, that's carbon free, and that's how you get up into the 80, 90 percent range. Right. Uh, right. Okay. Yeah, I guess on, on on the storage issue, I mean, I I still wonder, and especially you know, if if we do have more advanced metering that that will let us do other sorts of yeah. of of things, whether there aren't opportunities for peak shaving that wouldn't have some of the adverse environmental consequences and may in fact even be cheaper. Yep. I'm a hard time believing that even if you get a good deal on buying a battery now, then I should think it's going to get better and better. And I don't see any reason to jump toward a battery now. You, uh, I couldn't agree with that more. I spent an hour and a half with, with Velco last week, uh, who continues to advocate for the purchase of a mobile battery. Just think of a small battery on a tractor trailer. That's all it is. And I made the exact point to that group uh, as you just made to me. I, we're on the front end of a steep decline in battery costs by all <clears throat> estimates. And um, there's no hurry. <laughs> yeah. Sure, and the, the, the cost savings you have with the batteries of one point, we have a 1.25%. And that includes the amortization of the battery cost? Yeah, it's a 20 year. 20 year, okay. Oh, yeah, it's, the acronyms are changing, but the underlying contracts are much the same. We talk about PPAs or purchase power agreements when it's energy and recs. These are called ESSAs or energy storage. I can't even remember what the last two A's Supp stand for. Supply agreement. Any Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's a 20-year ESSA amortized out and very current pricing as of a couple of weeks ago now. So there is a little bit of a net present value there um, currently. And there will be more as time goes on because the avoided transmission rates are only going up. Nobody's talking about them going down. And batteries is the opposite. They are forecast to decline even more. So what, what actions or decisions come off this page? For right now? <laughs> I wish I'd printed that for you. There is an entire chapter <laughs> dedicated to the answering that question. So I'll just forward it and give you the highlights verbally here. Um, so we have an action plan, I think it has 10, 10 items on it. The first, and these are kind of in priority order. Um, so Mike, chime in if I'm 
mischaracterizing the orders you'd like to see them in. But the first action item is actually around automated metering of the structure um, to finish that evaluation and make a go, no go decision on that investment. Um, in terms of energy, that's number two. We're, we talked about those purchases from the 2023 to 27 period with and without Rex. That's number two on the action plan. Um, you don't really need any capacity. We just have to take very good care of Project 10, which we do. Dave Gagne and Ken Nolan and the owners of that plan. You could eat off the floors there. It's amazing. So um, I think we're good for capacity. Tier 1 requirements is next on the action list. I've already verbalized the most significant change there. The cost of complying with that has doubled in the past few months, and there's some upside risk. So um, Heather and I need to do for that what we already did for energy, which is size your need and get some pricing for you to decide whether you want to buy in at this $5 level that we're presently at. Um, tier 2, you are looking great on Tier 2 because H11 is about to be commissioned. Uh, but as I learned today, the Vermont legislature and Senator Perchelik in particular is going to continue to push for higher Tier 2 requirements in this next legislative session, so stay tuned on that. Tier three, the good news I heard this morning from the retreat was that we are exceeding last year's levels already halfway through the year. That's good news. So uh, that was prescriptive measures. Think electric vehicles, heat pump water heaters, heat pumps. But Mike has been great in getting you custom projects as well. So I can't imagine you're not doing great on the tier three side of things. How, from an energy standpoint, when you're talking about this, it just popped in, in electric vehicles with, with Ford coming out with an F-150, an, an all-electric F-150, which strikes me, just maybe my own biases, as being a vehicle that's going to have more appeal in our service territory than a lot of the other electric vehicles, um, how that's being factored into forecasts. I mean, uh, and, and, you know, do we... Do we get our one percent of energy from 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 from, from that? Um, yeah, great question. So I agree with your assessment. That's likely to be a popular vehicle. Ford will sell them as fast as they roll off the assembly line. It was factored into the demand forecast uh, at the front end of this document. There's an entire chapter dedicated to the demand forecast, and. This is not statistics and regression modeling. This is numbers that came out of the Vermont System Planning Committee. So think Felco plus the Department of Public Service plus all the utilities plus some advocates. Everybody beat that issue up around EV adoption and around heat pump adoption. So this IRP includes the most recent, I call it a policy forecast, Lynn, because it's not based in economics. It's based on, we want to meet these targets by 2030, 2040, 2050, and statistics and economics be damned, that's what we're putting in here. So the, the forecast is kind of aggressive in my estimation. I don't think it's going to happen that fast, but it's built into your IRP as if it will. And um, so therefore, I'm not worried about the F-150 Lightning because it's very much built in here. And those impacts don't really start to kick in until after 2030. Um, yeah, a lot of flashy yeah. headlines right now, but it's going to be a while before there's a lot of them out there. Yeah, in the Hometown Connections discussion this morning, we actually spoke about the F-150 at length. And uh, the responses there from Hometown Connections were that nobody's going to see one for at least 24 months, probably 36. Really? So plane-wise, yeah, I mean, and I said, yeah, I have three pickup trucks on order. I uh, ordered them 12 weeks ago, and they still have no idea when I'm going to get them. No clue. So it's the supply chain delays, because they were because Ford was talking 2022. It's not going to happen. That'll okay. be the first one. That's, that's the, the uh, test model. They made one. Yeah, I'm joking. Yeah, it's gonna, there's time to accommodate in the plan. So you're, gonna t you're telling me I'm going to have to buy something else first? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually talked uh, at length with them about trying out one of the battery uh, pickups for HED. And they're like, we have no idea on that one here. I was like, OK, I need trucks now, so get these. Yeah. Sorry, didn't mean to digress. 
support. So the, whole, support. Uh, the whole going 100% renewable is something I push on to take a look at. And this, so you were taking a look at the 100% renewable as part of the IRP as well, Sean, is that what I'm hearing you say? Or was this an adder per my request? Mike, I'm picking up about three quarters of just because of distance. Could you come a touch closer so I can get the gist to you a little closer? Absolutely, sir. I just said was your 100% uh, renewable evaluation in our IRP stuff as part of your IRP processes for everybody, or was that because of my uh, inquiries with you about us doing that? No, that was because of your advocacy. No one else wanted me looking at it. Yeah, I wanted to know if it was something we should be pushing for or not, and the message that I've been getting back is no. It's an interesting strategy. It's it's it. Because Burlington Electric did it fairly early on, they got some regulatory, how do I say this? They avoided some costs in the standard offer program, to be really blunt about it. That ship has sailed, unfortunately. The next utility that goes 100% renewable will not be able to avoid those costs, but there'll be some future program. Maybe it's the next iteration of tier two, right? Uh, that if you're already renewable, you'll have a stronger argument in the legislature to say, hey, hey, whoa, whoa, that doesn't apply to me. I'm there already. Yeah. That's that's really the benefit. You know, I can't model that in IRP because I can't predict the future, but there will be some conversation in Montpelier that will have a stronger voice in if we're much more renewable or 100% renewable. So not yet, but it's coming. Yeah, and, that would be the strategy. And I think the way I, you tell me if I'm right, the way I hear you commenting is that while you don't necessarily want to be on the very leading cutting edge, the first, you probably don't want to be on the trailing edge either. You right. probably want to be in the first half. So part of what uh, Sean spoke to, he was talking about like Amazon and, and these other huh? companies, it's really a huge piece of their marketing now to say that they're kind of yes. renewable. So these companies, Amazon has installed 3.2 gigawatts of renewable energy. Uh, Google, uh, 1.04 gigawatts. Verizon, 840 megawatts. McDonald's, 750 megawatts. Huh. Facebook, 725 megawatts. Uh, Lowe's, 250 megawatts. So it's it's a big marketing thing for these big companies and you know if it's so effective for them maybe that's something we want to be waving our flag about yeah. and this this investment has gone from basically uh, one gigawatt in 2017 to 11 gigawatts now in 2020. so it's i mean look at this chart you can see this far but it's like wow. straight up hmm. Some some of those companies were doing were doing solar before long ago yeah. long ago. Is most of that solar? <coughs> I'm guessing the vast majority of this is solar. This is the Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance who evaluates all this kind of stuff all over the country. So they're just buying. Yeah, really I mean, they're buying recs. They may may or may not be putting yeah. up panels. They're buying recs or putting up panels. Well, what they're doing, actually, we didn't get into this at the retreat today, but many of them are signing purchase power agreements for 20 and 25 years. It can be solar, certainly. It can be wind. Um, but what's happening is they're being called virtual purchase power agreements, and the virtual refers to the fact that they're sleeving the financial costs and benefits through to Amazon, through to McDonald's, through to Verizon. So they're not taking physical delivery of the power, that's still the domain of the utilities. But in every other financial way, they are bearing the costs and benefits through this virtual or financial PPA. Okay. But they're not building the panels themselves. They're Year, contracting with others. Yeah. Years, years ago, Google was, was the developer of so, some solar yeah. projects, yeah. Funny competition. I don't know if they're still doing it. Anything else for Sean? 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. You're, you're welcome. See you all in a month. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Mike, do you want to? I just hang up. I just hung up. Okay. Okay, so if we could go back to your summary of the retreat. Yep. So I. Uh, you were talking on. about FERC Rule 2222. Yep, which could open the door to some major uh, metering and rate structure uh, nightmares for Vermont's utility. Utilities, all of us. And uh, we, along with uh, hometown connections and everybody else are going to take up our positions against it. Uh, I actually requested that we actually set up a meeting uh, similar to one we had a couple of years ago with the PUC and let us, uh, public power, all, all the members come in there and have a discussion with them about this specific issue. Uh, because I don't, I really don't believe that the commissioner or the chair of the PUC nor uh, the new member of the PUC understand what this really would do to us. But why is this a PUC issue at all? Why aren't is VEPSA and and are we filing this? So, this is a this yeah. is not a this is is this a rule that FERC passed or is this a rulemaking? So FERC is developing with the ISO how this picture is going to work. The PUC will determine by themselves, whether or not your state, Massachusetts, Vermont, Maine, is or is not a participant. And if you are a participant, based on the PUC's decision, all this stuff falls in your lap that we're going to have to do. Okay. But has, is, is this a rule that has been passed by FERC? Not yet. It's okay. So, 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 yes. so my question is, why, it, since this is problematic for us, there are two levels that this can be stopped at. It can be stopped by the state opting out if the rule becomes a rule, but the other way to stop it is to stop it at the FERC level. Mm -hmm. um, and is VEPSA filing comments? Or if, if they're not, should we be filing comments? Is, is, is the American Public Power oh, yeah. Association NAPA, another? NAPA, Normal Public Power against it. Um, so the discussion we had today as a board at the retreat was that we wanted to target getting the state to opt out. So whatever does or doesn't occur, we want to be in a position to have the commission support us and say, no, we don't want to be part of that. But why not, why not try to nip it in the bud at uh, FERC? Yeah, this is a brand new topic to me today. So I mean, they're not mutually exclusive things, but, nope, but it, well. it seems to me that I'm just letting you know, yeah, no, a no, summary no. of where we were today. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, you know more about it than I do because I'm hearing your summary of it. So another uh, big thing we talked about, which Sean just mentioned too, is all this offshore wind that's coming into play uh, down Martha's Vineyard area. Yeah. Uh, with the costs of transmission as they are and rising as they are, Part of the big concern on these projects is the developers are pushing that all the transmission lines, which are going to be billions of dollars installed, you know, undersea lines out to this, these facilities, become PTF. As I explained PTF to you before, PTF is called is pool transmission facilities. So ISO New England says anything, any system or equipment that operates at 115,000 volts or higher, everybody pays for it. So these projects were supposed to be solely owned by the developers. Now they're pushing to shift to these billions of dollars in transmission costs and make all those subsea lines and all the equipment pool transmission facilities. So there's a big war brewing over that right now. But you, but you said that's at 115 and above. Yeah, these will be probably 345. So definitely yeah. above. So, so it's not, it's, but it's going to affect the transmission cost at our delivery point. Right. So every, yeah. Every, Even though we're much lower voltage. Yeah. The, every, um, so if Valco does a project in Vermont and spends a dollar, that gets 
uh, put across all the utilities in New England, right, all across the ISO. So when we do a project in Vermont, Vermont utilities pay very little for it. And our projects really aren't that big and expensive. We're, we're 115 kV and below pretty much everywhere. Um, but when you get into these 345 kV lines or 500 kV, I mean, you're talking big, big money just for breaker, you know. So it doesn't take long to get into the hundreds of millions of dollars. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. So that was a big topic that we were going over. Um, so Black & Beach is a big engineering and study firm in our business. And uh, they, they were, they did a report on the most challenging issues facing the electricity industry today in our region. And uh, I'll just rattle some of these off. Aging infrastructure, 33% of the respondents were worried about. Uh, renewable energy and its effects, 26%. Aging workforce, 24%. System upgrades and modernization, 22%. Environmental regulation, 22%. Cybersecurity, that's a big one that's coming up, 21%. Energy storage, 20%. Economic regulation, 16%. Distributed energy resources, 15%. Reliability, 12%. And market structure, which I think is probably the most important one for us, 11%. Because, and market structure from my perspective being how we're going to handle uh, time of use rates, how we're going to handle working EVs into our structure such that, you know, we remain revenue neutral. I don't see that happen, but um, I think that for me, as well as this, this is an interesting chart. So all these initiatives that are going on and all these cost increases and stuff brewing in the industry, new technologies, <clears throat> are going to add costs. And if you look at this chart, <clears throat> since 2000, or 1991 to 2018, everything has increased, but electricity has increased not too much. And that's because we fight so hard to stabilize our rates. And my biggest takeaway from this whole hometown connections thing today was we're going to have to begin some rate increases, and it's not going to be far off. There's no other way to deal with AMI. You know, it's going to be a $1.2 million project for us. The costs of things that we have in front of us that are going to be forced upon us by the PUC are all big ticket items and those combined with what net metering has done to us already we're going to be doing this but, but, on, but on, something, on something like AMI where we're talking about investing in infrastructure um, that shouldn't require it, it, sh it, it shouldn't it shouldn't well I mean it shouldn't be financed by current rates necessary. I mean, we should be looking at, at, at some sort of debt financing, I would think. Well, and actually, uh, we have a consultant yeah. who I'm probably going to get in here with us next month to talk about the whole uh, business model for the AMI system for right. hydroelectric. Right. So uh, she actually does a life cycle cost analysis and goes right through from A to Z and okay. explains how the whole Good. thing works. So. That'll be time well spent. All right. On the so they had all kinds of nice little things like this. So outage times for utilities. <clears throat> Electric cooperatives. A typical outage with no major events. Takes them 163 minutes to restore the power. In, uh, investor owned utilities, 133 minutes. This is national. And public power utilities, 55 minutes. All right. <laughs> Not awesome, but it's rarely that long. Yeah. <laughs> uh, talked a lot about cybersecurity I mentioned before and, and what's coming down the road with vulnerabilities uh, in our systems and what the, um, I can't think of the entity, but there's an entity, a federal entity that sets the guidelines for the standards we have to meet. And right now, BEPS is very involved in that with Project 10, because that's a ISO 
controlled unit. So we're aware of those things and how detailed they are and how much work they are. I mean, getting Project 10 up to the latest standards was a two-year process for Ken uh, Sanamore, who's probably one of the most technical savvy guys I've ever met in my life. So we're going to have more stuff brewing in that, too. So, so, so perversely, the fact that we are less technologically advanced, we actually have less exposure. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, and I actually specifically asked him about, so are, are you seeing these, uh, and are the concerns coming from, you know, supervisory control and data acquisition systems where somebody could get in there and dump the grid and nobody can turn it back on, or is it more customer information and customer billing? And they said the focus, the attacks so far have been the customer side. But if they can get in there, they, they called it an air jump into the other half of the systems. And that's a, the air jump there is like a huge security window finding, trying to find every gap and trying to find out how to close them before those jumps are made. I can't, I can't imagine that area. Yeah. It's way beyond my imagination. So typical customer expectations are changing. Uh, our customers want to be able to do business with us 24-7, 365. They want to be able to interact through social media, not, to, not just walk in your door, live uh, voice, websites. Uh, there's less loyalty and less tolerance for mistakes. And we're not being compared to just our neighboring IOU anymore. Amazon, Google, Zappos, and dozens of other providers, and they want the same level of services, regardless of what the services they're getting. Mm -hmm. um, and these, again, these are national stuff they were going over. So yeah, workforce changes, the baby boomers say, write me a letter. Gen X says, give me a call on the phone. Gen Y says, hey, send me an email. And Gen Z wants a text. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we need to be doing all of them. You know, that, that's, that's kind of one of the big focuses. You know, yeah. um, that makes me tired just thinking about that. I know. Oh, good. Went over today's challenges, uh, retirements, plus step, oh, this was a huge one. And <clears throat> so a lot of the discussion, even with after this, with, with just the BEPSA components, was about um, employees, staff, restaffing, general managers retiring, financial people leaving, not being able to hire alignment. And it's not just Vermont, you know, we've been talking about it in that's the meetings for a year now. But it's not just Vermont, it's nationally. And there's a real uh, effort, uh, Hometown Connections actually has a whole business model where they'll come in and run your utility for you. The, they have linemen, whatever, whatever, they'll set up whatever package you want. Of course, I didn't get any pricing on it, <laughs> but that's kind of where things are going because, for example, uh, one of our member utilities, Barton Electric, has been poorly managed for my 33 years in the business. They used to be one of our wholesale customers when I was at Citizen, so I worked with them a lot. And because of that mismanagement or poor management, um, they've landed in a place where they can't hire anybody. They can't even hire, they, they were down to one employee alignment just that he quit. Woo. Can't get a manager, can't get anybody in the office. So the, the trustees are looking to sell the utility. And, you know, if EPSA loses a member, that's no good for us or any of the other member utilities. So VEPSA actually put together a package and said, hey, we'll manage this. We'll at least get your books in order, we'll get you functional, we'll keep the lights on. Um, and VEPSA is looking at, is this, is this a function VEPSA should supply or offer to all of our member utilities? And the consensus today was, yes, but how, how are you going to do it? You know, <laughs> this utility wants two left shoes, this one wants two right shoes, this one's electric only, this one's electric water and sewer. So I, I don't know how we get there, but we, that was probably two hours of the five hours I was there. Is, is that what was driving the survey questions? Yes, yeah, seemed yes, like absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. One of your answers would post it up on the board, I know it was you. 
<laughs> Look at this one. This is how I know who that was. <laughs> Hardware Collector does not want to buy Barton. Oh, no, 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 no. It doesn't. Uh, so Orleans is interested, but Orleans makes sense because they share a transmission line that serves all their customers together. They share a substation that serves all their customers together. So for them to merge makes perfect sense. Yeah. How that all boils down, I have no idea. But the same questions are being asked in these small water departments around and about. They yeah. have the same kind of problems. Yeah, and I, well, like Lynn was saying today, I mean, hiring people is not easy. It's, uh, but it's but, but some of that goes to the question, Fundament, you know, does it make sense to have municipal, these small municipal utilities mm -hmm. at all? Mm -hmm. um, because that's, that's, the problem is, is exacerbated by that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, we're, we're prouder and have a lot of attributes, but like you say, on the, you know, economies of scale, it's a rough sell. And amongst the VEPSA utilities, we're about average in size, or hair larger than average? Uh, Lindenville is bigger than us. Ludlow is bigger than us. They have a big ski, uh, ski yeah, compound down there. Just in the upper half, yeah. And uh, Morrisville is larger than us. So we're, we're actually just above the middle, I would yeah. say. Uh, we spoke about increasing financial pressures from capital improvement uh, on existing infrastructure, which we just went through, $260,000 on our 3319 plan last year. Uh, the new technologies we're going to need, customer expectations, uh, rate structures not mirroring cost of service versus fixed costs. That's a, that was a big discussion, too. Is, um, rate increases are have not been focusing on the fixed cost component, and you've mentioned this many times with us. And you know that's probably where most of our efforts should be, and most of all our efforts should be going forward, uh, getting those fixed costs covered better and more accurately to benefit everybody. So that's more of a rate design issue than, yes. than level of rate issue. Uh, so there's some identified national trends in rate making. There's increasing demand, uh, oh, I just said this one, uh, for fixed charges to recover distribution costs. Volatility in power supply markets is resulting in more utilities using power cost adjustments and or rate stabilization funds. Uh, CV did one of these. It was a, uh, what did they call it? Well, they're, they're the old fuel, fuel adjustment clauses. I mean, Similar, yes. when I was yes. doing rate design uh, 30 time, odd time years ago. rates are going to be completely widespread, more frequent and smaller rate increases, which we've already, BEPSA actually got legislation passed last year. Uh, where municipals who have a 10 year requirement. Anyway, utility, public utilities can institute a 2% rate increase or less up until the point they reach 10% of their, they can't exceed 10%. On the 10th percent, they have to go in for a full rate case. Hmm. And that's law now. That's, we just got that passed, yeah. That was a session? That was this past session, yeah. Great. Yeah, that was one of EPSA's strategic initiatives, and we got it. Um, one of the caveats that the PUC put in there, though, was you can't, if you've gone 10 years without a rate increase reviewed by the PUC, you can't execute it. <laughs> so our next rate increase will be a full rate increase. And then we'll have 10% of 2% limit. Presumably, does that cover rate design also, though? Or it's just it's just the rate increase? So if, in other words, to the extent that we wanted to restructure the rates, not just, not just increase the level of rates, we'd need to get PUC approval of that. Correct. If we want to restructure, that has to go in front of them. If it's okay. a simple, 
Yeah, and I can't remember the wording they use, Lynn, but it's basically if it's a simple uh, across the board rate increase of 2% or less, then it doesn't need regulatory review or approval. So if we if we if we did a rate increase, we still could do it subject to refund. Yes, absolutely. So they haven't still, they haven't taken that no, away. No, definitely not. What do you mean refund? So IOUs and other entities uh, have to get PUC approval before they can change their rates. Yeah. Public utilities can change them now. Yeah. And subject to the PUC you saying no, we can't do that. Change it. Ten years. Yeah. And then you have to refund. You have to you, you refund to the customers what, what they were in essence overcharged. Right. Yes. When was our last rate increase? Two thousand and nine. Yeah, more than ten years for those. Yeah. Is there is there any limit? In other words, if we went in for a small rate increase, we would have to do the rate case, but then we would come under the two percent rule in the future. Correct. Yeah. Once okay. once we run a full rate case, a full rate analysis, which would be part of our filing, then we start over and we have those 2% available. It sounds like it would be worth it if you're going to go in and go in for a large one. Well, yes and no. It, it, you have to, it has to be cost justified. I mean, you have to, right. what, what, what you, it's, it, it's not a large one or a small one. It, it is what it is. Right, and it's, it's not cheap to, Run a rate, you know, file a rate case. It's big money. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Big money. <clears throat> so you don't want to go in. Wait. Well, you, you don't want to. That's it. You don't want to go in every two years. This is a major money saver for us. You know, projecting. Well, if I had to go in every one of those two percent increases, I'm going to spend all this money. Well, we got to pass. What's all that money spent on lawyers? Well, expert witnesses. And expert witnesses, yep. <clears throat> uh, you need to do a whole cost of service study. We can have a discussion another time if you want to know about cost of service studies. Um, right. So which is something which is something that we would have to do also, right. a more limited one, and if with these if we were going to charge like customers for transmission not customers, oh, yeah. but generators for transmission, we would have to do that with FERC. So it, Saving twenty thousand dollars is probably not going to. I mean, if it's an every year thing, maybe, but we'd have to look at the numbers. But it, it's yeah. not inexpensive to do um, a filing at FERC. So you probably ought to do a rate structure. To ask those questions. Oh, I thought it was not fair. yet, but it's coming. Okay. I think after twelve years, it'd be nice. There's only one PUC in the whole state in America. That is correct. Yeah. Yeah, three not, number not one. Northern Vermont or Southern Vermont. No, yeah. just one. So that's kind of my highlights of the the Ooh, busy. hometown busy. connections. I mean, they, they crammed a lot into their time. Yeah. And then uh, Ken spoke to the strategic initiatives of last year and how the successes what were successes, what were misses, what were fails, and laid out this year's uh, strategic initiatives too. I can share these electronically with you and let you chew on all you want. Mm -hmm. That'd sure, be that'd be great. If we'd like to have Ken come join us and go through them next month, we can certainly do that. Why don't we, we can all take a look at it yeah. and then see if there's a, a, a need to yeah. have him come in. Okay, so you'll, you'll give me feedback on these. Yeah. How often do you have a retreat like that, Mike? Once a year. And, uh, oh, wow. it's, it's really good. It, and, you know, I said, geez, I go all the way down, I'm warring again. And he's like, well, it's a, it's a good deal down here, it's a nice place. And we do, because the, the first few years he did them, we did them in Waterbury. And, you know, Sean's phone is ringing, he has to go take a call. It's like, you just gotta get away from the, and he's right. We get a lot more done and get a lot more out of it. And bringing the, actually bringing this facilitator in today uh, from Hometown Connections, I said, oh, who are you? What are you doing here? Why, why? Well, I'm here because Ken's gonna get a lot more out of this and give you guys a lot more information because he's not having to facilitate this meeting. And totally, he did, it was really good. Good. Yeah. 
really, really good. So on this, they were getting they were getting down into the weeds of this support system structure from VEPSA when I had to leave. So I'm sure I'll get more data on that for you going forward. Yeah, it would be good. It would be good to see what sorts of things were being discussed and what. Because I think there was, I mean, just coming out of the survey, there was struck struck me that there, the questions were good questions, and it's a lot to think about. Um, you know, I could see on a lot of the things pluses and minuses. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of having Vepsa do certain customer things. Well, on the one hand, they might be very efficient at it. On the other hand, the further we get from our customers, the more distance mm -hmm. it, it 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 mm -hmm. you start to scratch your head. We don't really generate very much. We don't do, you know, right. and, and we're not going to be dealing with the customers. Somebody else is, we, we then know less about our customers mm -hmm. because we're not touching, touching the stuff. Right. Yeah, but I can't imagine being you know, stow. They, they, you know, they don't belong to us. You know, have they, have, they have more staff. They, yeah, they have more yeah, staff. Yeah. But, 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 you know, they. Stowe is, Stowe is, because they have such a, a big commercial and industrial load, their, their load is much bigger than ours. They, they have the same number of customers, roughly. They, I forget whether they're a little bigger or a little smaller, but they're in the same neighborhood that we're in. But, but, but you know, I think their, their plant and service is what, is three or four times ours? But I feel like our peak loading is about seven megawatts. There is about 18. But I was thinking of all these questions that you're reviewing at, at this meeting. I mean, how in the world does one small entity face those? I mean, they, they they, and they also they hire outside experts. Yeah, you know, well, they hire they, they hire have the money to do so. So they don't. They a lot of the functions in that. So for example, Vepsa is our power broker. Yeah, they have a power broker. It's just not Vepsa. Oh, it's, uh, they hire some other outfit. Energy in New England, I think they oh. use. It's, but it's they provide that service for. Them. Okay. They have in-house IT, uh, in-house uh, financial people, you know, s sections that, like our IT is all out of that. Right. If I have a problem with a computer, I call Ken, yeah, but they do it in-house. But as far as the power brokering, they, they farm that out. They farm that out too, so then that would probably be our life, okay. So I think an interesting way to frame it is, because you already have this as a precedent, is that IT support makes sense because it doesn't diminish your connection with your customers and you're never going to be able to afford your own right. IT resources. So then as you work through, you can continuously evaluate when does it make sense to go in and source it out of EPSO versus when is it vital to our existence to not do it. And then there could be triggers like some new compliance issue exactly. that just swamps yeah. us or you need some new software that we can't implement on our own or you need so so it's really good to have VEPS as an oh, option yeah, yeah. so it's <coughs> great that you guys are wrestling with it and saying mm -hmm. what about this what about that and and we did the best we could in the survey yeah giving them some feedback well and I think I think part of again my sense on the survey was, and I know there were questions, you know, about, you know, gee, I, uh, somebody doesn't know something about something, is to see what our different perceptions were. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, and there's, and there's value in that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I thought it was a, a good thing. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Any other questions on the retreat? If not, um, that takes us to the uh, other business, new business, revisiting business, which is just in terms of the office being opened and more or less back to business timeout. Yeah. Okay. So last meeting, uh, you all gave the green light to get open back up. Uh, and we. We actually just opened to the public today. Um, and the reason was because we were so short staffed. And last week we spent the entire week with SCDC people here training. So I said, let's get that behind us. Let's get these the new customer service staff up to speed rather than overcommit to our customers and open up and then be overwhelmed and under-delivered. So I postponed everything we opened today. We'll uh, 
partially for the week, so half days for this week. Next Monday, back to pre-COVID business. That's where we're at, so Good that's group. different than what you guys had asked. Back up on that. What was that training for last week? The SDC? What is what is that training? So SCDC is our customer information system provider. Their software does all our customer accounting, so all the billing, metering, all that, plus all the GA, all the general accounting, AP, payroll, all the stuff. Which our our department employees do. Um, so. I had people on the GA side who needed help, so I got the experts in here and trained them for the week. I had people on the customer side who needed help, I had two experts come and train them too. So they have 40 plus hours of training and I actually have the GA CPA coming back in September for another week of training. And who's in the office now then? So right now we have Deb, Shara, and Karen. Sure. So we're one short, we're really two short because Deb's just behind and still here. Uh, Deb was doing two days a week, right now she's, she's working. Full time. So Sheriff what? Sheriff is new. You don't think Sheriff is new. Yeah. Yeah, you met her when you came in to sign. So oh, that was Sheriff. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And so what are, what are their positions at this point? Or, or are they all doing the same thing or do, are there different? So right now, there uh, we have Kind of the front office is the customer interactions, customer billing, customer accounting. And then the back office is the GA stuff. And once we get staff fully up to speed in their respective areas and get back up to full staff of four, preferably five, then I want to start cross-training people into duties so everybody, at least two people can do every duty. That's the ultimate goal. Um, and that's, that was the ultimate goal when I hired Karen, and it didn't work out, and I'll speak to that when we go into the executive session. Are you using the Denise Stewart now? No, Denise Stewart and I are still talking. So you're low on staff. Oh, yeah. yeah. Who's the longest employee that's there? Uh, right now, Brian, my foreman, it's his 48th year. How about in the office? In the office, uh, Deb, obviously, she's 23 years. And our employee that left was 20 years. So. Everybody else was new, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. Brian is 48 years? Yep. <laughs> that's, <amazing. laughs> that's hard to beat. Yeah, I got a call from a customer uh, down in Woodbury the other day just would have given Brian a big hug and a kiss if he could. Just, you know, we don't know how good of an employee you have there. Rah, rah, rah. It was really nice. Yeah, I had a lady yesterday at a party chewing my ear about something, and uh, Brian was looking good, and I called Brian and he gave me all the details. He's excellent. He really, yeah. he, and he yeah. loves yeah. Sergeant Blanc. Loves it. I like Miles. Day he drives. I mean, yeah, he, he is he is nonstop. He's Logan, not, Logan, I Logan. see him everywhere. I go out. I see Brian. I mean, I don't know what this is about me, but I know he's driving. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's excellent. I'd take the whole team to him. So, with the office open, you said earlier. So we've got we've got a sign up that like the sign out here that says if you're not vaccinated, wear a mask. And there's a box of masks in on the table and you know, all okay. that stuff. Yeah. And and what about for the 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 line crews in terms and are because sometimes they're going up to people's houses and knocking on the door and talking to somebody. So do they wear a mask when they go up if they're not vaccinated? No. Nope. I, I believe they're all vaccinated. Okay. So. Yeah. so um, and with new staff coming in, they may or may not be vaccinated. So everybody in the office who's not vaccinated. Everybody now is. Okay. Except me. And you're wearing a mask. Yeah. Everybody is. Okay. Uh, the yep. others are okay. And if someone. And Brian included? Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Does anybody feel there's a need for additional policy beyond that? 
Well, it's it's if you're not vaccinated, you wear a mask. Yeah. Right? Yeah, which is consistent with the town. And yeah. Practice. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So I think I think. Then I think that takes us to um, an executive session. Um, somebody want to? Once we go in, Jim. Once we go into executive session, we'll stop. We're going to have to stop the uh, the filming. Do we want? Do we want to say anything about you know, the fact that one commission could be here today and requested? You know, we do Zoom, and we said no. We're we're doing what the what the select board is doing, uh, which is which is in person meetings, which is. Yeah, I don't even think they were uh, the select board meeting I went to last week. I don't think was uh, was any filming of it, but uh, maybe I missed it. Possibly. I, yeah, they might have missed one. I think was, I didn't see any cameras going. On. I I wasn't That's there, so I don't I don't I don't know. Um, okay. Because once we have a meeting like this, I, can't, I think it's kind of too bad that we can't bring in a fifth. Because you don't run into the, when you have 15 people trying to do Zoom, it's bad. When you have three or four, it's not very hard. In fact, it's easy. But it does open up a can of worms. But it doesn't work well to do. And it could be three or four. I mean, of course, we're over to the public, and if we had three or four people in the public, then it becomes pretty difficult. Well, and as we're being filmed, maybe there will be people coming right. from more people coming to the meetings. Because the person over there can't hear, can see. Anything. Well, and the person and the person who isn't here isn't going to have whatever the handouts were, if they're handouts. Um, we can, we can certainly revisit it. Um, yeah. Has another agenda item on another meeting. Sounds yeah. It's it's we we've got two executive sessions that we've got to do, and it's already uh, almost uh, a quarter of seven. Um, so, uh, is there a motion to go into executive session to discuss the employee matter, the public discussion of which? We don't need the public discussion. Oh, okay. It's a, an employee Stop. matter is confidential. Stop. Second. Any opposition? Hearing none, we are going into executive session at 644. 644 it is? Yeah. Is this, is this off? I don't know if this is off.